This is the, the last lesson in this quarter. Of course, this is a first commentary. We have two quarters in a commentary. But, uh, lesson 13, advance, advancement without compromise. Now, that, that's a good motto for the church, I think. It would be a continual good motto for the church. It's back several years ago now, we had, a, I think it was a CPMA uh, theme, 100 years with no compromise. That's a, that's a powerful testimony. I want that to be the testimony of my life. I don't want Amen. to compromise my beliefs. I don't want to compromise the will of God in any way. Uh, looking back over this series on the studies in God's precepts, the topic selected may have seemed to be largely negative or pessimistic. Actually, they are both positive and negative. They are scriptural, and scripture is positively true, even where it deals, frankly, with negative truth. No blanket coverage has been intended where sin, misconduct, abomination, worldliness, and hypocrisy are dealt with. Now, I read that sentence a couple of times. I, I understand what the author is saying here, but I just I feel it needs a little bit of clarification, just in case that seemed a little off. Now, I believe what the author is trying to say here is that even though this quarter has covered a multitude of topics, this by no means is a full and exhaustive list of everything that humans are capable of in defying God's will here on earth. There may be some who say, none of these topics apply to me. Therefore, my behavior is acceptable to God. As the advice to members tract states, no list of rules or advice could be as complete, comprehensive, and distinct as the New Testament, which is our rule of faith, practice, government, and discipline. If we are walking by the will of God's Spirit, there won't be any question as, as to what is proper behavior. As, as Sister Pauline was speaking this morning, is that if we know the voice of the Lord, we don't have to worry about the 29 teachings or the advice to members. If we hear His voice, we're going to do those things that He asks of us. We're, if we recognize Him for who He will, uh, is, there will be no question as to how we should behave because we will submit ourselves to God's will, whether it's written down on a piece of paper or not. Because the Spirit of God will never lead us in error. But it's our own responsibility to be certain that our behavior is in line with God's Word. This is why we much sp must spend as much time as possible in God's Word, in our prayer closets, and among His people. That way, when we do find ourselves out among the lost, we will be the examples whom God would have us to be and not be influenced by their behavior. That's part of the problem with the, 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 those who would consider themselves Christians. They're more concerned with fitting in with the things of the world, the people of the world, than fitting in with the will of God. So they, they camouflage themselves not only to look like the world, but they also behave like the world. And in doing so, they bring reproach upon Christ, and nobody gets saved. There's no benefit in that behavior. But, but we're called to be lights in this darkened world. We cannot be lights if we're trying to be, blend in with the behaviors of the lost. God's Word is the mirror of the soul. The sooner we see our own actions and reactions reflected in its pages the sooner we'll be able to recognize our own flaws and begin to allow God to clean us up to be the witnesses whom He would have us to be. And the sooner we can make a difference for good in this world. I'm going to back to the commentary for just a second here. But God so loved us that He raises the red flag of warning as well as the white flag <clears throat> of approval and victory. That's one of my favorite, favorite uh, accounts that anybody has told me in the church. Uh, Sister Betty told about the, the young man who ha they had visit their house. And I, I know I've, I've mentioned this multiple times, but it's, it bears repeating. Because 
we all need to have the same attitude. When we, when we reach out to others, they need to understand the importance of this attitude as well. When he was, when he was given the understanding of the 29 teachings and the advice to members, he was excited. He, he, was, he was so happy because he saw, wow, God loves us so much that he's put down in paper some things that help us to live our lives pleasing to him. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to wonder how we're supposed to behave. We, we know. And he was so excited to have that information, to have that understanding, that he could walk forward in those things in faith, knowing that these are things that please God. And of course, that's just advice to members in 29 teachings. We have the entire New Testament that, that is the same thing. We have the Old Testament as examples of how to and how not to behave. All of these things are blessings from God. It's not a curse to have the 29 teachings he invites to members. It's not a curse to think, well, I've got to try to live up to this. It's a blessing to know that God not only gives us the instructions of what it takes to live our lives pleasing to Him. It's one thing to have instructions. That's, that's, that's nice to have. When you have something you're having to work on, to have instructions a lot of times is a great benefit. But God goes beyond giving us just instructions. He goes beyond giving us just an understanding of what it is that pleases Him. He gives us the strength through His Spirit to fulfill those things, to do those things freely and without, without weight, without struggle. He gives us the power by, by the Holy Ghost to, to do those things that He's called us to do. Far too many feel restricted by the limitations imposed upon them by God's Word. As a result, they rebel against the government of God by crying out legalism. They fail to recognize the importance that these truths contain. <clears throat> Excuse me. These tracts were, the information in these particular tracts were searched out by souls who had seen firsthand the damaging effects of such behavior. In this world, even if no such law exists, it's a good idea not to text and drive. Anybody agree with me? It's, it's just a good idea not to do it. Those who do so are immature and unaware of the extreme dangers involved. They believe that they are perfectly capable of both driving and texting at the same time with no possibility of any unpleasant outcome. Those who have personally lost loved ones, whether those who are, who are texting and driving or those whom they hit and killed, know the risks involved. Some studies show that texting and driving is more dangerous than drinking and driving. Still, those who do so feel confident and their behaviors. Why am I talking about texting and driving? What's that have to do with the lesson? It, it, does that even make sense? Yes, yes it does. Because the attitudes and behaviors of those who disregard the advice to members are identical to those who text and drive. Such people have no regard for their own safety, nor are they concerned with the safety of others. By their disregard, they encourage others to do likewise. Now, you may be able to avoid danger some of the time, but you can also be sure that when destruction does come, it will be totally unexpected. Micah 6 and 8, He has showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and, love, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. A God has given us good and bad examples throughout His Word. It's our responsibility to recognize where we as individuals fit in with those examples. Do we line up with the good examples or do we line up with the bad examples? That's how the, the, the Word of God is a mirror to our lives. If we recognize where we fall, then we can see whether we're moving in the right direction or the wrong direction. We've been given an understanding of the Word of God, but are we willing to see where we're coming up short, where we're failing to measure up to those good examples, to those good things that God has, has given us the, the ability to do? 
whether we choose to do them or not? Are we open to correction from God's Word? If so, will we allow Him to cleanse us of those spots and wrinkles? If we, if we allow Him to do so, we'll also run to Him in order to quickly remove those hindrances from our lives so that He can use us as He sees fit. This isn't about, this isn't Burger King. You don't get to have it your way. This is God's way. Or do we think that we know better than God and we can make better choices and, and we can make better uh, options for our lives and the ones that God has already directed us to make? Do we believe that only certain portions of the Bible apply to us? Very few in the church would own up to this type of behavior, would admit to behaving this way. But this is exactly what people do when they reject the importance of the advice to members. God desires to place His approval upon His people. But if we reject His will and substitute our own, the results will always be rejection. God's approval will be seen in the forward momentum of His church as we begin to see more and more souls looking to the truth of God's Word for guidance. How's that approval looking from your point of view? How do you see the church moving? Is the church pressing forward as she should? Are we doing those things are we moving as we should in the right direction? Are, are our, our doors being knocked on and, and broken down for the, the crowd of people trying to rush in and get here and join us? If not, we need to recognize how, how it is that we're falling short, what it is that's causing us not to be the examples who would, re, re, who would cause that kind of behavior in those we come into contact with. I'm talking to me as much as I'm talking to anybody else here. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't go, set out to step on people's toes. When I, when I start writing these lessons, I sit down and I, let, I say, God, you give me what I need, what I need, what we need. I don't go back and try to figure out how long it's going to take me to go through the notes. I, I say, Lord, whatever it is, I want it to be your word. Because if I, I know if it's his word... It's going to be good. If it's my word, I'm, I'm going to cause problems. I'm going, to, I'm going to make mistakes. But if I receive from God, He'll be glorified. And we'll be encouraged to press forward in His will. And back to commentary here. The church is one body, and all are affected, positively or negatively, by what goes on in the body. Criticism, reproof, or rebukes should be given in the spirit of love and concern, but they must be given. The author here capitalizes must. <laughs> it's imperative. It's important. It's critical to our, once again, that forward momentum that I was talking about. Ecclesiastes 8 and 11 says, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Without quick action, those whose poor behavior goes unchecked will begin to spread to others. Those <clears throat> time will soon, those whose behavior goes without discipline will believe themselves safe even in the midst of their sins. Time will soon come that they will not recognize any of their actions as sinful. This behavior was recorded in the Old Testament. This isn't any kind of shock to us when we see this kind of behavior, when we participate in this kind of behavior. It shouldn't be a surprise to us. We have the examples throughout the Word of God. Often God's people would sacrifice to idols. And the fire of God did not immediately fall down and strike them dead. They didn't fall over dead. They didn't suffer any ill effect. Therefore, in their own minds, they were justified in their actions, that their actions were acceptable. All that was written aforetime was written for our learning, 
This is no different. God's word supports itself in every aspect. God was merciful to his people and did not want to destroy them immediately. It was his willingness for them to repent that allowed them to continue to live in these sins. He sent his servants, the prophets, to cry out to his people to change their ways. And they refused. And so it is today. Very rarely may one die as a result of ignoring the advice to members. But out of concern for our souls, our leadership reminds us of their importance. If we continue to ignore their cries, <clears throat> we will find, our, find the end result different. I'm sorry. If we, if we continue to ignore their cries, will we find the end result different from those in the Old Testament? God was so concerned for our eternal souls that he sent his son to die in our place. When we ignore his will, we are despising that worthy sacrifice and placing Jesus in open reproach for our own selfish will, for our own selfish desires. This behavior requires correction in the spirit of love and fear for the benefit of of the entire body of Christ. Those who reprove or expose sin are often hated. Jesus said, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, Matthew 10, 22. And if the world hates you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. <clears throat> John 15, 18. Well, is it any wonder then, when we try to help others to see the truth which they are despising, that they do not often receive it with the grace of a child of God. Excuse me. But they often do lash out as children of the enemy. It would seem then that to lovingly reprove or expose sin amounts to fellowship with Christ. Golden Truth, Galatians 6 and 9. It's one of, I, I have so many favorite verses, and I'm sure everybody is the same way, but this is one of my favorite verses. I love this. This is a verse of encouragement to me on so many occasions. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. In due season, that's God's due season. There are so many times we want things to happen according to our timetable. We want things now. We want things yesterday. But God doesn't work according to our will. God works according to his own will and his own timetable. We have to be submitted to His will. And sometimes that means we have to wait. We don't like to wait. Humans, generally speaking, do not enjoy waiting. But if we want to be pleasing to God, if we want to live our lives acceptably before God, sometimes waiting is necessary. The work of those who do well in this world the work of those who would do well in this world, according to the scripture, is wearying work. It has a tendency to wear on us. When has there ever been such a time of cynicism as today? When has there ever been such a time of rebellion against authority as today? From, from the smallest children to the oldest adults. How, 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 when has there ever been such rebellion? When has there ever been such a desire to satisfy self at any cost, even to the cost of life? There's, there's a desire to fulfill selfish satisfaction, that selfish satisfaction. Sadly, we see this in the church and among those who call themselves Christians. For those who are truly seeking God's will, these are very difficult times indeed. For those who are serious about their desire to see God's will accomplished in this life, we have the potential to be very, very much wearied by the behavior of those around us. We read in 1 Peter 4, 17 through 19, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them be that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? 
Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in doing well, in well doing as unto a faithful creator. So if we're suffering according to the will of God, in other words, if we're in the will of God and by being faithful to God, we are suffering for our faithfulness to him, then we will look to him to strengthen us through those trying times. We would do well to, strengthen, to look to him for that strength in those trying times because we know he's faithful to us. And as faithful as he is to us, we ought to be faithful to him. We ought to submit ourselves to him. If Jesus was willing to suffer and die in our place, all he's asking of us is to live. All he's asking of us is to live in his place, to behave as he would have us to behave, to submit ourselves to his will in our lives, not for our own glory, but for his glory. And not, not just for his glory, but also for the benefit of souls whom we come in contact with. We can reach out to by being fully submitted to God. Sadly, in this situation, this passage of Scripture, we see a view into the very near future talking about judgment must begin in the house of God. We see, we see the destruction that awaits both hypocrites and those who don't affiliate themselves with God in any way, shape, or form. Sadly, they are both equally condemned before God. But we also have the answer to avoiding that fate in our own lives. In this life, there will be suffering. Uh, it's something that we're assured of. It's something that's certain to happen. But how much better is it to suffer knowing that our suffering is a result of our desire to see God's will accomplished through us? Our suffering will stand as an example of our faithfulness to those who look on. It will encourage others to stand fast in the face of their own difficulties, knowing that the end result of our suffering is going to be the salvation of souls. This is the harvest that should press us ever forward toward the goal of holding out faithful until the end. The harvest will be worth whatever effort God calls us to. It doesn't matter how hard we have to work while we're here. It doesn't matter what God asks of us while we are in these fleshly bodies. When we see, there's a song, I think, one moment, just a, just a single moment in his presence will be worth any suffering, any struggle that we face here on this earth. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Part 1, beware of new revelations. We're living in a time of constant change. Nearly everything is outdated before the new wears off. Christendom at large follows a similar pattern. The craze for progress or advancement keeps them experimenting with some new thing in the hope of gaining members or finance. The church, of course, desires progress, but it must not be sought at the price of compromise. When two persons or groups compromise, each must give up something and accept something in its place. The church, as the pillar and ground of the truth, cannot do this. Excuse me. <clears throat> in order to understand the definition of new revelations, as described in this section by the author, we must also acknowledge the inclusion of compromise. These new revelations may seem appealing at first glance, but anything which requires us to set aside established truth is not a revelation from God. It may have been revealed, but that does not make it come from God. Satan revealed truth when he told Eve that the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good and even evil would open her eyes. This was a fact. It was an absolute truth. The, the enemy of our souls, Satan, the serpent, the devil, he told the truth. But only in order to cause destruction. <clears throat> 
But in order for her to accept it, in order to accept this truth that the devil told Eve, she had to set aside what God had already said. She had to take what God said and said, this isn't important because I believe this thing. It's absolutely true. It would open her eyes. She had a revelation. Sadly, it was not a beneficial revelation. It was very detrimental. It was a very destructive revelation. But that was a revelation from the enemy of our souls. Something was revealed to her. She compromised on her obedience in order to gain wisdom. Of course, the enemy failed to mention that the knowledge they would gain would only be detrimental to their relationship with God. This is the same choice that many are making today when they see something appealing in the world and try to incorporate it into God's plan contrary to His will. Now, on the other hand, God will supply His people with additional revelation as we draw nearer to the end. One of the failures of the Pharisees and Sadducees of Jesus' day was their unwillingness to receive additional information. Now, I'm not talking about new revelation that removes the old. I'm talking about new revelation that builds on top of what we've already received, that supports, that, that goes along with. When Jesus came, his responsibility was to reveal more of God's light to God's people. That was his job. His job was to show the Jews who he was. He was the Son of God. Once again, this was a fact. But this fact would have been very beneficial to God's people. But they believed themselves to have a complete understanding of God's will and his word. They closed themselves off from receiving the light they needed to move forward with God's perfect will for their lives. Today, God has yet to reveal the fullness of the truth contained in His Word. He's crying out through His Spirit to any who will receive and pass that good news on to others. The light we have currently is critical for us to keep our eyes focused on God and the path that He set aside for us. The additional light, not the new light, the additional light that God has for His people will in no way override what we already know to be true. But it will support it and bring more clarity to what we already understand from God's Word. If we deny the advancement of God, that God would have for us by refusing to receive any more of it, we hinder our own spiritual walk and the spiritual walks of future generations. We will find ourselves condemned beside the Jews who rejected Jesus. Jesus said in John 16, 13, Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that He shall speak. And He will shew you things to come. God wants to reveal more of Himself and His truth to us. We only need the discernment to recognize it and the willingness to receive it. <clears throat> Part A, hold to established truth. 2 Peter 3 and 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing that ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. We know Bible doctrine, and we have covenanted to believe and practice it. Therefore, we must beware of any enticement to accept anything opposed to it. No matter how appealing it may seem to be, to be led away, one must follow. This is a very, very critical part of this lesson this morning. In order to be led away... We have to follow. If we're going to be led into the truth, we have to follow. If we're going to be led away from the truth, we have to follow. That means it's our option. That's our choice. We can believe the truth or we can believe a lie and be damned. We have that option. We've been given the choice. 
Why? Why? Why would we ever believe a lie when we have the fullness of the truth at our, at our grasp? God wants to reveal the fullness of this truth. He's already given us a, a, a lot, a good portion. He wants to reveal more of His truth. Peter indicates that even the steadfast Christian can be deceived. In 2 Peter 1 and 1, Peter addresses the, this in his letter to them that are, have obtained like precious face, faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the third chapter of the same letter, the verse that heads this section, he warns us of the possibility of falling away from our own steadfastness. And once again, he addressed the letter to them who have obtained like precious faith. He's talking about the saved. He's talking about those who have received the truth. Now, we just read, in order to be led away, one must follow. Now, there is real danger <clears throat> in allowing those established truths to slip from our grasp. Now, the Bible tells us that no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. But if we walk away from the truth by our own free will of our own accord, God will not prevent that departure. He may warn us of our actions. He may send someone to guide us back to Him. But the choice to remain in His protection is ours to make. Just like it was our choice to fall on our knees at the foot of the cross at the Spirit's leading. Satan is seeing to it that there are many attractive options to draw us away from God. That's his job. He's really good at it. We must be aware of his devices and avoid them at all cost. Part B... Grow up and settle down. Ephesians 4 and 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the clock. I'm having a hard time thinking I'm going to be able to get through this. I'm going to try to see what I need to leave out in order to get to the end. Real quick. Okay, I'm just going to skip this commentary and go right on to this. And once again, henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. This is one of those opportunities that skeptics like to use to disprove the, the Scripture. Jesus said that we must be as children. But Paul here says we shouldn't be like children. I believe the author of this lesson handles this admirably. Childlike faith trusts in the Father to, pro to provide every need without question or concern. A child doesn't wake up in the morning wondering what he's going to eat. A child doesn't go to bed at night wondering how he's going to be able to keep a roof over his head. It doesn't wonder about... Rent doesn't wonder about uh, having enough money. That child goes to bed and wakes up with a clear and free spirit knowing that whatever he needs is going to be provided for him. Childishness, on the other hand, seeks to please itself with no concern for others. These are two very different aspects of all children. And the distinction between the two is very clear. Just one sentence here from the commentary at the bottom. Uh, this section, there is no advancement for the church by fellowshipping such as these or allowing them to continue with their behavior, those who practice to deceive. Deceived deceivers, part C. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. By the, both they and their evil works will wax worse and worse if they are not apprehended. It could have become as simple as a simple misunderstanding and grown into a small following. Or it could have been deception from another source. Whatever the origin, the outcome of deception will remain constant. There is no room in the will of God for the slightest bit of this type of behavior. 
and all who follow such deceivers will receive the same reward. Ignorance is never an acceptable excuse as long as the Word of God and His guiding Spirit are supplying the directions to heaven to human souls. They must be avoided. Now, loving reproof is often the answer to many problems we face. It is the mercy of God to reveal a shortcoming in us through our chosen leadership rather than allowing it to continue on to our eternal separation from God. But sometimes more drastic measures are necessary. We have our perfect example in Jesus. When he dealt with those who, would have, who should have known better, he was much less loving and considerably more harsh in his reproof toward them. That's not to say that he didn't love them, because it's clear that he did. He died for them as well as us. He suffered for the sins of the entire human race. But there will come a time when our approach cannot be soft. The Pharisees and Sadducees should have known better, and as a result, his interactions with them were much more aggressive. Thirteen times Jesus used the word hypocrites, with an exclamation point most of the time, in, or in an accusatory manner against the religious elite of his day. Three times he called them vipers, and once serpents. He was the Son of God, and it is certain that his behavior was good and proper in these instances. That's not to say that we should always do likewise. But we must have discernment to know how to respond to every situation according to God's will. Only the only only then will our behavior elicit the response that God would have for every situation. Once again, this is not how we should reach out to the lost. We we can't reach out to the lost by beating on the head and telling them how horrible they are. But those who should know better, sometimes this is, this is the proper response. Sometimes this is what God would have us to do. But we have to be sensitive enough to the Spirit to know the difference. We can't go in our own will and do these things and expect God's will to be accomplished. That's why we have the verse, what is it? The, the wrath of God worketh not the right, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We can't go in our own wrath and think we're going to do God's will but we have to allow God's will to work through us as He would have it to. Wow. Part 2, God's jewels. Malachi 3, 16 and 17. Then they that fear the Lord spake off and one to another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before Him for the them that feared the Lord and, and that thought upon His name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. And I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Part A, God rebukes His chosen people. I hope everyone studied this lesson because there's a lot of good stuff in here and I'm having to cut a lot out because i got two minutes left. I'm just go to the very last uh, sentence of that, par that section. We must not miss the point that these records are speaking to us today. This is a passage of Scripture that I'm about, the passage of Scripture that I'm about to read is not often preached or taught, but it's critical to our understanding of God and His desire to see us prop, prosper spiritually. Hebrews 12, 6-11, For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom He receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye... Be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our own flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But He, that is God, for our profit, that we might be partakers of His holiness." Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Now I think I can speak for all of us when I say, I don't like being corrected. I don't enjoy it. 
I don't enjoy my errors being pointed out in public or in private. I don't enjoy that. But I know that if I will receive that correction, I can draw closer to who God has called me to be. I know that if I have fallen short, I need someone to show me if I can't see it myself. It's the only hope I have to make it in the end. It will work toward my eternal good if I will allow it to do so. But how I respond to correction, it's up to me. Will I submit to correction or will I rebel against it? Will I acknowledge my failure or will I refuse to? Will I own my mistakes and step up a little higher or will I deny them and fall back into sin? Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. That includes the trials we face as a direct result of our own failures. It's hope for a brighter eternal future. We must only receive these corrections as we should and use them as, a stepping, stone, as stepping stones along the path to perfection in Christ. Excuse me. Wow. I got a lot more notes and a lot more commentary. Um, part B, faithful remnant. Hold fast. There's so much more good stuff in here. Um, but I'm not going to hold you any longer. I, just, I pray that something's been said that was a blessing to somebody. I'll go ahead and turn it over.